very good, he said. Neither am I, I replied. About five minutes later, a girl grabbed my ass. I'd never liked that, and it irritated me, but I ignored her. She came around a second time and I said stop it, and I continued my game. I guess it embarrassed her in front of her friends, because she started gobbing off at them. Then came around behind me again. I turned when she was less than a foot away. I'll tell you once, fuck off, I said as her face turned ashen. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Mark said. My brother will kill you. Who do you think you are? She said, running off. That's why, Mark said. Who's her brother? I asked him. No, that's all I did with the red top, he told me. <laughs> Great, I sighed. What are you going to do? You should go, he warned. Fuck, I'm playing pool, I answered. What well, if he comes back, Mark said? Well, firstly, he's got to get past dude. And then you can beat him up for me, I said calmly. Mark stepped back and smiled. He cracked up laughing. Listen, mate, I don't want any trouble. But if he does get past dude, if he does find me, and if he does ever got a new guy, which I doubt he will, because he's a bully, and no offence, mate, but bullies only pick on people who let them, then, and only then, will I sort it out, I told him, bending down to take my shot. How? he asked. With this, I said, holding up the snooker cue. Mark started laughing, then stopped when he realised I was serious. Oh, um, okay, he said. I walked back with Mark that night to find he lives just a couple of rows down from me. He was a good guy. We came friends to the point he'd knock on pips for me, and we'd go hiking together. He was bullied a lot, but this lad who owned a farm close by. Mark never fought back. Sometimes we'd go to his house, and that's where I first encountered a normal family. It was amazing. His house was quite a big semi-detached. His dad was rarely home. He wasn't working. He'd broken both his wrists in an accident at work, which had laid him off, and ruined his hobby of Aikido. He was a friendly guy, he told so many far-fetched stories his wife had to turn to shut up when the TV was on. They welcomed me with open arms. Mark's mother had previous jobs, but at the moment was looking after the kids. I felt comfortable telling her I was moving into my father's here a couple of weeks, and she smiled warmly. They were all Welsh, and I felt their accent warm and caring, unlike my previous foster carers, who were also Welsh. Not de yet, dear. It's not time yet, she said, moving into my father's. Mark nudged me. My mum used to do tarot reading. She's never wrong. I laughed at Mark, but my eyes stayed on his mother, and I believed her. Mark and I listened to placebo in Texas in his bedroom. He fancied the last from Texas something rotten. I didn't care much for the music, but it left a calm atmosphere, as did the household. We were playing Killer Instinct on the games console, when a beautiful five-foot-nothing blonde appeared in the hall. Mum wants to know what you want for tea, she said just as her eyes briefly met mine. She immediately went shy and quiet. Hi. I said into her light blue eyes, and she ran off. Didn't know you had a sister, I asked Mark. That's Anne, she's all right, he said. Staying for tea, he asked me. As much as I'd have loved to play Happy Families, I was scared. It felt too nice, and I knew I didn't belong. I said my thank yous and made a sharp exit. This was their family, not mine. School arrived again, I was in the third year by now. Not much had changed. I'd stopped kickboxing when the coach had asked me to spar with a girl and I'd refused. He said spar with her or you'll spar with me in a threatening manner. So I let her hit me a few times, but wouldn't retaliate. Hit her, the coach said, and I walked out. A week later he was in the paper. Some guy had a go at him in a pub, and the coach had bottled him and got sent down. I'd been back at school maybe three days. I was playing football when the lads, when Derek Baker shoulder barged me. After two of the fights, I thought this shit was dealt with. I ignored it and carried on playing where he did it again. Drop it, I told him as I turned out the shoulder barge and regained my balance. Or what, he said, squaring up to me. It was automatic. I didn't even think. The jab was thrown as it stepped into my personal space and my right foot had gone behind me. I jabbed twice more, catching his face, folded with a right, just as he threw a right hook. I'd blocked it before it was anywhere near me. Everything was happening in slow motion, unlike our two previous fights. I hit him with two straights and clinched his neck, giving him a one-two with my knees as I brought my head downwards just like in kickboxing. Whereas before everything was a struggle to keep calm and get the hits in or out and thinking about my attacker. This time everything just happened effortlessly. It was surreal. I caught him twice in the chest hard before I dropped an elbow into his ribcage. He was smaller than me in height, but awful round, and my elbow did nothing. He pushed me back towards the floor trying to bring me down with his body weight. I pivoted and slipped out of the way, sending him another knee to the chest on his way past. He stood up straight back and took three steps backwards before coming at me fast, throwing punches. None of them hit me. Block, counter, block, counter, move, block, counter. I wasn't being big-headed. I was simply better trained by them. He 
He stepped back after a few hits to the face with no real damage done and threw a kick. I shocked myself when my shin came up to block it without me telling it to. I was even more surprised when I regained my balance and kicked him in the chest hard with the same leg. I heard the air go out of him and he bent double. No, leave it. It was done. I told him and walked away. I'd got perhaps two steps before I heard a growling sound. Arr! He screamed as he hurled himself towards me. Not at all sounding like a pirate. Let's try that again. Arr! He screamed. No, still sounding like a pirate. Let's just say he growled. He screamed as he hurled himself at me. His arm caught my face slightly as I turned on one leg to face him and grabbed the flailing arm. Fuck it. I unloaded elbows and punches to his head as he hit the floor with me falling on top of him. The momentum rolled me over and he had me pinned to the ground. He was bleeding, but I couldn't see from where. I crawled downwards, giving him less room to hit my head and more room for my legs. What I had in mind was risky, but if it works, I'd win. If it didn't, I'd end up with Lardos sat on my head, and I didn't fancy that. By now, I knew he'd go for big hits. He always did, standing there. And here, he'd feel totally in control. Sure enough, he threw his body weight back and came down with wide, arching hooks to my head either side. I blocked maybe six, and they hurt, but not as bad as they would have done if my arms hadn't protected my head. By six he was tiring, and I seized the opportunity. I pushed myself down a little further as he leaned back to take another big swing, and I flipped my legs up and around his neck from behind. Then I rolled forwards, pushing down with my legs. I spun over and crawled on top of him, throwing him a hook here and there, enough to keep him guessing, not enough to do any damage. The next time he tried to hit me, I grabbed his arm with both of mine and pulled him forwards and flung my feet underneath his back and linked my legs. Now one arm was trapped beneath my leg, his head was stuck between my legs at an angle and I had hold of his other arm. He was pretty much fucked. He did the only thing he could do, tried to bite me, at which point I simply tensed my legs together tightly, cutting off his airway. A few seconds on and off of this, every time he tried anything, and he very quickly mellowed out. I released most of the pressure from his neck and jabbed him in the face. It's over! then followed with a cross, which would have made his head move if it had not been wedged against my leg. Okay? I asked him. He grunted of what the lad shouted, Hit him! I ignored him as everyone else was shouting, Fight! 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 How had I not heard them before? They weren't important. Removing the danger was important. I gave Derek a final squeeze of my legs and got off him and walked away. The lad called John approached me from behind. What if he wants another go? He asked me, looking to cause more trouble. Fuck off or I'll drop you, I said, turning to look back at him. I looked back to see if Derek had got up. Okay, mate. Cool, cool, John said. I was finding myself at Mark's house more than I was at Pip and Tony's. Patrick Benson had just been to visit to tell me it would be another two weeks before I moved in with my father. I didn't mind. I liked being at Mark and Anne's house. I'd been playing on the games console with Mark when we were called down for tea. I made my usual excuses and left for an hour. I didn't go back to Ben and... I didn't go back to Pip and Tony's. Instead, I'd walk the fields. I wasn't hungry, and I couldn't get Anne out of my head. I had played the conversation over again. Anne had said, Mum said you can stay for tea any time. To which I replied, I'd love to, really, but I should go. I'd follow Anne down the stairs, watching her golden hair fall over her shoulders. Mark followed us, taking the stairs two at a time. When you're ready to join us, it's okay, you know. Mark's mum said, not waiting for an answer, and stood watching me from the kitchen. I smiled a genuinely big smile as I looked at Anne in her usual place at the head of the table. I'd love to be a part of that family. Thanks, I said, heading for the door. See you in an hour then, Mark's mum said from the kitchen. I felt warm inside. I kicked a stone. What did she know about me that I didn't, I wondered. I trusted them all totally and had told them nothing. When I returned, everyone was in the front room. Dad on the chair watching TV, mum in the chair knitting. Move a pan, let him sit, the dad said. It's okay, I'll sit here, said even though I had made space. I knew I'd go red sitting so close. I sat on the floor, in between Mark and Anne, leaning more towards Anne, who had blue jeans on. What are you making? I asked Anne's mum as the conversation soon turned to their previous jobs. Then to music and to Anne's schooling. She was quiet. The kids in Wales had bullied both Mark and Anne for it, but mainly Anne, so they'd moved to Tarvin, where the bullying had continued by other children. Anne wasn't good at maths or English, explained Anne's mum. Anne had turned red with embarrassment. I smiled at her apologetically. I have homework, she said, going to the kitchen and sticking her head in a book. I remained seated on the floor. I grew up in care. I am in care. We were homeless. I'm trying to move back in with my dad. Two weeks, they told me, but who knows, I said. Would you like to know? Mark's mum asked, placing her knitting down. Yeah, yeah, I would, I said, thinking the genuine question over in my mind. 
He doesn't want to read him, Mum, Mark said. I didn't know what a reading was, but Anne's mum had taken a box from beside her chair and sat in front of me on the floor. I can use the cards to tell you, but only if it's something you really want to know. I know your heart's been broken, and I know you'll always follow your own path no matter what I tell you. Do you want me to read? She asked me with big wise eyes. Yeah, yeah, please, I replied. What's your question? She asked me. When will I move in with Dad? I replied. Can we say... What will it be like when I move in with Dad instead? She asked. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, I replied. She went on to pull some cards, which I took no notice of. You'll move from here soon. You'll find everything you asked for. And there is a lot more than just Dad. You will find it all because it drives you. You want answers, but I must tell you, it will not be what you expect it to be. It won't be what you want. You will return to Tarvin. You will look for us, and we'll be gone. You will try to find us. That is all I can tell you, she said, looking a little sad, but smiling. Thank you, I won't lose you. I look all of you, even Mark, I joked, punching his leg. He smiled, but I could feel his mum's words had hit him harder than any of my punches could have. I looked back to his mum. Thank you, can I have a drink? I asked her, and headed to the kitchen where Anne was sat. She looked up and pretended she hadn't. What are you up to? I asked. Homework, she mumbled. Okay, I said, going back to the living room. I sat there maybe five minutes watching TV. Then I thought, fuck it, what's the worst that can happen? Can I go and talk to Anne? I asked, looking at her mum. Of course you can, she smiled. And I had that feeling again, that she knew me better than I did. As I walked past her chair, she touched my arm gently, and her energy shot up through it. I felt it like a little electrical torrent, and I was humming with it. You know, she said slowly. I nodded. I knew what she meant. One day I would do for others what she'd just done for me. I felt it when she'd read. She wasn't really here. The atmosphere had changed. Nobody else caught it, but that energy was thick in this family, particularly the females. I had no idea what it was, but it was the same thing that let me feel Nan in the chapel of rest. Hi, you okay? I asked Anne. She didn't look up or reply. What are you working on? I asked. Maths. She said, tapping the book with her pen and keeping her eyes on it, but not reading anything in particular. She was just waiting. May I sit down? I asked, pointing to the other chair beside her. If you want, she said with a little smile, curling her head away from me slightly. I do, but only if you want me to, I said, gently remaining standing. You can sit, she said, waving her pen in the chair's general direction. Thank you, I said. She looked at me, but without making eye contact, it was a question. For letting me sit, I added. I waited perhaps 40 seconds while she pretended to study another page lay on the table in front of her. Looks hard, I said. Yeah, she gave. Having trouble, I asked. I don't understand it, she admitted. That sucks. Mind if I take a look, I asked her, feeling as though I was turning into Nigel. She turned the book a fraction. Mind if I come closer, I asked. She smiled, so I pulled my chair towards her. Now we were both leaning over the book. Ah, okay. It's a pain. They've worded it really stupid. But what they mean is, I explained the sum, making a point of giving really colourful explanations. Imagine four bags of marbles. Each bag holds ten marbles. And you gave me a bag because I've lost my marbles. How many are left? I wasn't sure if she got the joke. She didn't laugh. She did answer the question correctly, though. Well done, I said. So now you give Mark a bag and how many marbles are left? I added. Twenty marbles, two bags, she smiled. I'm really impressed. Let's write down twenty, I said. We went on for about half an hour before Anne went really quiet, quieter than her usual quiet self. I let her stay in that phase for a while. It seemed important to her. Why are you helping me? She asked, her eyes meeting mine fleetingly. She smelt great. Because I choose to, I replied. You don't have to. You're here to see Mark, she said, putting her head down. I don't just come here to see Mark. Would you like me to leave you to it? I asked genuinely. She shook her head, but made no comment. Cool, because I like talking to you, I said as her head flew up off the table in a look of complete shock, and then she did make eye contact. And these sums won't do themselves, I added, turning the book back to her and tapping it with my pen. We chatted for about two hours, with me only moving to get another drink or help with the homework. Every night after that, I'd spend an hour with Mark on the games console. Say hi to his parents before going on the hunt for Anne.
I had to spend the remainder of the night with her.